Right. Hi, everybody. Thank yes. you for joining us uh, at Aperitivo Time. Um, I'm Sharon Rashavi. I'm the president of the International Center for Journalists based in Washington. And this is a uh, panel discussing COVID-19 and whether it was a journalism extinction event, as many were concerned, or whether it was a reformation moment. So I've got a few great panelists here, some of my colleagues and folks who've done some great research on this topic. Uh, Julie Pacetti is ICFJ's uh, Global Director of Research. Uh, Nabila Shabir is our uh, research associate. Uh, Emily Bell um, is the Director of the Tau Center for Digital Journalism in New York. And Natalia Antalava is the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Coda Story, which is based, uh, she's based in Tbilisi. So thanks everybody for joining us. So the premise of this panel came out of research that, that we collaboratively Collaborate, I can't speak, collaboratively did, um, try, uh, surveying more than 2,000 journalists in 145 countries in seven languages. We did this in mid-2020 to try to understand what effect the pandemic was having on journalism and what effect it might have. Um, and we learned a lot. Um, we're going back to it, as, as, as Julie and Emily and, and Nabila can tell you. Uh, resurveying, figuring out what the longer term uh, impact of a pandemic that we thought, didn't think was going to last quite so long, uh, what that is on journalism, and, uh, and talk about some recommendations as well that have come out of the data and including initial data that we're seeing now in our, in our new research. So let me uh, start with Julie here. Thank you, first of all, thanks everybody for joining us. So I, I guess the main question is basically go to, going to the title of this, you know, many had feared that this was going to be an extinction event, that media organizations were going to collapse left, right, and center. Um, others were hopeful that maybe something new would be born. So what's your, uh, you know, analysis in terms of where, where the, uh, Pendulum swung. Yeah, I think, look, when we um, launched this research project in uh, March, April 2020, just as the first wave of the pandemic uh, was causing us all uh, great disruption and enormous concern, and as it has continued to do so over the past few years, we were very concerned. Um, many commentators were concerned, and I think Craig Silverman was probably the first to suggest that this was the news media's extinction event. Um, likely to be the news media's extinction event. And I think many of us were extremely concerned that he might be right. Um, here we are in 2022 as the fourth, fifth, what are we up to now, wave um, is, is predicted um, and starting to take hold uh, around the world. Journalism is still alive in many sectors and in many regions it continues to struggle, but we're here in Perugia at the International Journalism Festival, kind of um, you know, ready for a revival moment, I think, uh, for the future of journalism. But nevertheless, as our research initially mapped, so we had um, the survey that Sharon mentioned um, with over 2,000 uh, journalists participating around the world, and the number one concern that they identified, or the need that they said was greatest, was for financial support to continue operating. So we had a figure of 75% of the respondents in the 2020 survey that we produced identifying um, the, the ex extreme need for financial assistance. Um, that was uh, indicative of the kind of crises that um, multifaceted crises, but predominantly a financial crisis at that, at that point that was being uh, delivered, you know, through another assault on traditional business models that were advertising dependent. So we are still alive. There are some organisations that are thriving, uh, partly as a result of the work that they did uh, in the context of the pandemic, building trust with their audiences, proving their vital role uh, in sharing accurate, reliable um, in public health information, for example, countering disinformation. But we are in a position now where we can see that there are, you know, um, as the Reuters Institute report acknowledged, um, you know, few winners, but many losers in this context. Um, and we'll come back to this in a moment, because uh, I'd like Emily to weigh in here on, on that question as well. But um, we've now launched the second survey um, from this project, 
to try to determine two years on what the experience looks like, not just economically, because among the, the really important findings were um, the threats to press freedom and the safety of journalists um, that were emerging as a result of you know, what some have called the disinfodemic uh, in combination with the media viability crisis um, and restrictions and threats against journalists around the world trying to do their job of reporting accurately, fairly and critically on government policy. So we've just launched this next survey and I'll share some of the data with you that um, is, is very preliminary but indicates um, certain shifts in experiences should we let Emily yeah, I was just take about to say, Emily, do you want to chime in? What, what, where do you fall in the uh, reformation versus extinction event uh, pendulum? Well, so I, th I think, as Julie said, um, one of the things we saw right at the outset of the pandemic was uh, large numbers of newsrooms reporting at least a 50% drop in their um, uh, revenues because there was an immediate collapse of the advertising industry. Mm. Um, we didn't see the economic, um, like all of these things, it's actually been a sort of, it's been an episode of extreme inequality for news organizations, which are the larger, wealthier news organizations have actually done really well. They've just had a most, probably the best financial year a lot of them have had for a long time. Uh, but we tracked both through this research and actually research that we did um, at the Tower Center on the, uh, called the Journalism Crisis Project, uh, what was happening to smaller outlets or sort of nationally, 100 newsrooms either merged or closed, over 6,000 jobs disappeared from the field, you know, again, in just all the, the course of a year. Uh, and we don't see, we haven't seen any uh, relief at uh, local level. Um, we see a very, um, we ha we've seen a very uneven pattern um, in terms of whether, you know, even, even new newsrooms that you feel would be very equipped for the digital age have actually suffered, uh, perhaps sort of dis disproportionately. Um, we identified one or two things in the research, which I would call big impacts that have played out and continue to play out through the pandemic and actually sort of post-pandemic. One of those I would say is it really emphasized how the lack of diversity in newsrooms is, is an urgent, urgent problem. And I think we knew that. Um, but we saw as, uh, as, as, as the communities, particularly in the United States, that were most impacted um, were uh, people of color. It, it's be, and, and, those, and newsrooms didn't really reflect that. Uh, and I would also say that the politicization of the story mm. was something else which has sort of followed, uh, I think, you know, that, that debate um, has moved into the newsroom now. So this is a really big effect, which is now having granular sort of issues at, at a low level, um, not a low level, but like a granular level within newsrooms. Uh, and I think the other thing to, to emphasize is that our top line finding, as, as Julie said, was, you know, as we went into the pandemic, I think some of, sort of an overwhelming majority of journalists that we are, something like sort of 78, 80% said that they felt um, uncertainty, financial uncertainty was, mm. a, was a strain placed on the already uh, significant um, strain, personal strain that journalists were, were under covering a story that they were already part of. So they're mm. already worried about their health, their family's health, their exposure. Uh, and uh, you see now at the pandemic, I mean, well, hopefully it's this end rather than the middle, <laughs> but you know, we just, fingers crossed. Um, but, but, but we've seen, you know, and I think we've seen some, so, so where I think there is hope is that, that I think that we've seen some of, some of these issues play out into uh, movement for unionization in newsrooms and more uh, stable uh, working environments. I think we've seen more pressure for um, better working conditions in terms of people's um, work-life balance, mental mm -hmm. health, uh, because it's really difficult you know, the, the intensity, I think it's really hard to overstress the intensity with which most journalists worked during the pandemic mm. and often isolated. So, you know, it's a team sport and when you're isolated from your teammates, it's, it's particularly stressful. And so, so I think that sort of it hasn't been an extinction event and, and the one, but it has been a, a, an accelerant. I think it's, it's accelerated all of the trends that we felt yeah. were coming to the fore in newsrooms and created, you know, I think a, a, a healthy set of, uh, a healthy sort of pushback 
tension and, and, and sometimes, you know, confrontation in newsrooms about what priorities are for organizations and how they look after mm -hmm. their journalists. You said something, uh, Emily, that I just want to go back to. You talked about how new, new newsrooms, innovative newsrooms, yeah. were unexpectedly badly hit. Can you yeah. talk about what you meant by that? Well, I think that, you know, one of the things that we've seen is that well, what I meant was it's unpredictable. So, uh, you know, you would have looked... You might have looked at a newsroom like BuzzFeed as a newsroom that had uh, diverse reporting staff, um, very much was uh, dedicated to new beats in reporting um, that works uh, very much online. We've seen because of its ownership structure and its funding model um, in the last couple of weeks, uh, first of all, sort of it, it, it had an enormously reduced uh, newsroom and international operation just before the pandemic. At the end of the pandemic, as I say, at the end of actually a very good financial year for most global players, it has contracted its newsroom again. I think that we're going to hear about more layoffs from other um, digital sort of native newsrooms this week as well. So, uh, so it's, an, it's a, that resilience, I think, comes from... Do you have the right ownership model? Do you have, I mean, non-profits we see growing? Yeah. Uh, and do you have the right priorities in your newsrooms? Are you in this for the long term? Because I think that's the other thing, which is uh, newsroom leadership are finding out, have found out, that actually, uh, you know, the, those skills of leading uh, organizations through what are really sort of personally difficult times for journalists is a real test of leadership as well. And I think that some organizations have done well during that and some have actually really suffered. And mm -hmm. you know, we, 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 it will be really interesting in the follow-up survey we're doing now, so we'll circulate the link, please, please fill it in, send it to all your friends. Uh, we've asked some rather more granular questions about n newsroom practice and how being out of touch with your, perhaps daily touch with your editors has affected the way that you work how um, having a more distributed newsroom might be an advantage for some people. Uh, and so hopefully we'll see coming through that. Um, and we've made it, I think Julie's probably going to talk about, or Nabila's going to talk about the recommendations mm. that came out of that. But a lot of those are built on what we saw as a sort of a fragility. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and also, you know, as I say, post-pandemic, we're seeing, I think, organisations that are really committed, absorbing the lessons of it and investing in the right sort of change and we're seeing other organizations that aren't committed uh, actually sort of really kind of pulling back I think from journalism which again is, is a shame. And we're also seeing um, impacts on newsrooms that were dependent on short-term or medium-term you know grants uh, which, which are some of those kind of start? Yeah. We used to call them startups. You know, what are, what are the uh, what are the implications of a major ongoing crisis like this on their capacity um, to produce journalism uh, the, for the long term when they've got such uncertain um, you know structures in place that are dependent on um, short to medium term grants. So. Um, I don't know. Oh, wait, yeah, let me, Nabil, I wanted to get you to weigh in on, on the financial viability. Nabil has the dubious distinction of having worked at a newspaper that went under uh, during COVID and news organization and, uh, and researching this. So I'd love to get your thoughts on that issue. Yes, hello, I'm Nabila. My job became extinct in the <laughs> pandemic, as did a few of my colleagues who are in this room today, who I hope will agree with me on my little assessment of that. So. Before joining ICFJ, I worked uh, at The Correspondent, so member-funded, member-driven um, international media. So we had been in existence for six months uh, before the pandemic came along. And at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, in terms of newsroom practices, we saw how a lot of people were adapting to working the way we were, which was lots of staff working in four con continents, you know, across time zones, working digitally. We even did well-being check-ins at the time because we were not all in the same office together. Um, and so this tracks with something that one of our recent survey, uh, from, from the second survey, one of our respondents said, if you create a safe space virtually, writers feel comfortable continuing with their work. We've been supporting each other and checking in during the pandemic, being more aware of personal details and situations. So we were already doing that. Um, and at the beginning of the pandemic, I would say our organization had a slight spike in memberships. There was this feeling of solidarity and wanting to 
uh, contribute to whatever might happen, this extinction event idea of the, of, of the media. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, members are humans too, and so um, some of them became unwell, they started to lose revenue sources, there was this general cost-cutting, and you could see that being reflected in membership for, for our media. And so um, another thing that one of our survey members said recently in, in the second survey, uh, the pandemic just reinforced that readers want full coverage in this age of tweets and texts. The audience still values news that directly affects them, even if it's happening far away. Um, but ultimately, it was decided at the correspondent that uh, members wanted more national news, uh, not uh, international news. Uh, you know, it was a confusing time. It was a mysterious time. Um, and, um, yeah, so, and, you know, borders were effectively put back into place and implemented, which is not what our organization was attempting to do. I'm looking at my colleagues for affirmation there. Um, so, in our case, it, it was decided that it was not sustainable to continue as a media organization, like, not to commit to whatever change this might require. Um, and I don't think there was the space to sort of redefine what we needed from our members, you know, in that sort of emergency period. And so, there I was, redundant in a pandemic before Christmas, um, but it's fine, I, I've lived to tell the tale. And um, we did have some audience engagement findings from the recent snapshot of the, uh, of the pandemic, which I can share, which is just that, um, you know, uh, journalists have told us who, who've replied to our second survey, they've worked harder on identifying their community's information needs, they've experienced more engagement with their stories than usual, some of the details are that they are trying to work to convert non-paying readers into members, into paid members. They are starting membership programs. Um, more of them have taken down paywalls than erected them. And um, they've been introducing new member offerings such as, you know, more newsletters and things like that. And ultimately, from their perspective, audience trust has increased uh, in their work during, during the pandemic. So those are some positive there findings. <laughs> Not to, okay, we're gonna go back to negatives, sorry. Um, <laughs> <That's too much. laughs> I wanted to, but thank you for, uh, thank you for the uh, little bit of optimism. Um, that is interesting. I wanna talk a little bit about the, some of the findings around the press freedom and disinformation. And one of the things that, that the research, your research revealed is that, you know, COVID has been used as an excuse to squeeze out, squeeze press freedom, to squeeze freedoms in general. And it's been associated with rising disinformation. Uh, Natalia, I know you, you've talked to, to, to Emily and Julia and Nabila about, about this. Can you tell us a bit about, about your experience, sort of at the beginning of the pandemic and kind of where things are uh, yes, now? Um, absolutely. I'm afraid, though, I also have a, I, uh, I have a very positive story, oh, COVID good, story. Good, good. And, uh, <laughs> you know, this was, uh, COVID was definitely not how Coda wanted to prove its editorial model. Uh, but um, we were on the other side of that spectrum um, in, your, in your study. We, we, were non, we were already highly distributed. Uh, we're a nonprofit, so we were not relying on advertising. Um, and um, we are financially unstable and poor, so the financial instability was not sudden, and we were used to not, you know, <laughs> uh, to that. So we um, actually doubled our budget, doubled our staff, and more than quadrupled our audience throughout the pandemic. And I think the main reason we did that is because we're, we are a slightly different newsroom, we're a thematic newsroom, and we cover the roots of global crisis. And COVID hit very much at the intersection of um, the four main channels, the four themes that we have, which is disinformation, authoritarian technology, so surveillance obviously grew massively, uh, war on science, um, and, and pseudoscience, and, um, and oligarchy, because, you know, rich got richer. So we had spike in all four of these um, uh, kind of areas. And what we, what we do, we don't pigeonhole people into one of these themes. We want to do the opposite of that. We want to create connections and show people how these crises are, what are the currents that run through this crisis, and how they are connected to each other. So the growth, um, you know, it, it basically people, were very interested in understanding the context um, to the pandemic because by the time it all started, you know, we had done stories on 5G and anti-vaxxer movements and, uh, you know, all these things that suddenly came into the mainstream. Obviously, as a small nonprofit newsroom, we suddenly, we were ahead, you know, and it's, it's, it's then how do you stay ahead when you have been ahead, when all of the big newsrooms are now pouring resources into this story, but that's our problem to, to have and tackle. Um, but of course, one of the main sort of the um, 
uh, drivers of both our audience interest was, uh, was disinformation. Um, and, and the disinformation battle that you know we have always treated as a global crisis before, and COVID made very, very apparent. And um, so, building, you know, and the the war in Ukraine today, like another crisis with same themes that are running through it as as COVID did, you know, is um, actually it's fascinating how it's using some of the same channels that we saw being activated through. Um, you know, uh, during during the pandemic, for example, you know, one of the ways that the Kremlin is now getting its message through is um, to to the mainstream is through the anti-vaxxer groups that created mobilized that were created and mobilized and grew massively. I mean, grew to the point when they became political parties in Europe, right? Through the pandemic, that has now become the channel of. Um, you know, other COVID, they, they're all now busy basically uh, spreading, spreading the Kremlin narratives. And um, so, um, I mean, yeah, it was um, obviously through the pan, I mean, this information was nothing new, but through the pandemic, it became, you know, it became about each of our, like, health. Uh, it became very personal and it became um, very important to everyone. So COVID effectively became a building block that now is, is being built on to, to further disinformation, right? There's all these infrastructure. Yeah, place. absolutely. I think the networks that were created on many, many different levels, you know, the anti-vaxxer groups are mentioned is one. The, another thing, uh, for example, the, the COVID transformed the relationship between China and Russia. Uh, you know, while diplomats around in, in Western countries locked themselves in, the diplomatic traffic between China and Russia was, you know, uh, massive. It was during COVID that we first saw Chinese state media and the... Um, uh, uh, and the Russian state media work together very, very closely, pushing the same narratives. One of these narratives, for example, is the same narrative we just heard um, in the Ukraine war that you might have come across about biolabs in um, Ukraine, U.S. Pentagon-funded biolabs in Ukraine, and they, they are like as one of the ways of justifying Putin's invasion of the country. Well. Those Chinese and Russian media went crazy, um, you know, pushing that narrative throughout the pandemic um, as well. The pandemic, the, the narrative, kind of a counter narrative to the Wuhan story, right? To the Wuhan lab story. The Chinese and Russian state media were saying, well, what about, you know, what about those Pentagon funded labs in um, Georgia and Ukraine and um, the rest of the region? So, so the overlap of, I mean, the playbook that is being, disinformation playbook that is used, that was used during COVID um, is now being used during, during this war and will be used again. Um, but I think the networks that were created, uh, disinformation networks that, were, that the pandemic helped to create, um, you know, are quite powerful and widespread. Can I just add something to that, Sharon? So, I mean, in the first uh, survey that we ran in 2020, we, we saw evidence of this starting to emerge. We, um, disinformation, countering disinformation was one of the key challenges identified by the journalists internationally. They also identified um, state-led um, disinformation campaigns and political actors in particular as among the top perpetrators of disinformation, alongside the function of the platforms in facilitating disinformation and public health risks associated with that disinformation, particularly Facebook, uh, which was, was singled out. And we have the same That's kinds right. of struggles that we, so we've rolled from one crisis right into a, another crisis, which as you say is, uh, is building on the same disinformation networks. At the same time, you know, we have um, an international community of exhausted journalists who are continuing to try to report on the pandemic in meaningful and constructive ways, dealing with the crisis themselves in a personal capacity, also now, you know, in the, in, in the wave, if you like, of a, of a, of a conflict, um, which I think, you know, to just move the conversation on slightly to the issue of mental health, which was one of the, the major um, issues that came out of the first survey. So um, the, the top impact that was identified by the journalists we surveyed um, was impacts on mental health and well-being. 70% of them said that that was the worst um, of the effects of the pandemic on them. And if I can just segue now to the new survey which we have um, launched um, 
with Emily and, and the Tau Centre, uh, which uh, we launched about a week and a half, two weeks ago. Um, we've just taken a little data snapshot um, to share with you this evening. Um, we only have about 120 um, survey participants so far across five languages. Um, so this is very preliminary, but um, I think still interesting and valid to share. Um, and what we uh, have found is that whereas in the first survey, the top rated um, need was financial support, urgent financial support, the top rated need now, it's flipped, is responses to mental health issues. So um, I think that's quite, you know, it's very early uh, evidence, but it is, it is relevant. So we're in a situation where those combined and compound impacts are really starting to demonstrate um, a needs-based response on that issue. We're also seeing, um, from a disinformation perspective, an increase in the uh, percentage of people saying that um, state-based or political actor-based uh, disinformation is a problem and continues to be a problem, um, and that Facebook, again, is well overrepresented in terms of the platform identified as the biggest vector um, for, for disinformation in the context of the pandemic. Also, uh, the biggest platform where journalists have reported um, evidence of disinformation being present. So I think that's kind of, you know, this is again early evidence, but it's, it's interesting to, um, to see the way that's evolved. So in the first survey, uh, mental health was the fifth top need in terms of responses that were called for. No, it's the no, top need. That's yeah. interesting. That is yeah. interesting. Um, one thing from the first survey, which I thought was interesting, and we'll see what happens now, is that, and I think you were surprised, Julie, is that when we, when we, we again, we did it in seven, seven languages, is that global, the global responses were pretty uniform. And so, and, and so I'm curious to your thoughts as to what that, what that tells us about, about uh, the journalism, you know, response to, to COVID. Sure, I mean, Emily can weigh in on this too, but just, just a, a top note. Um, this was, you know, this was a global crisis, and while there were different manifestations, which um, Natalia has eloquently identified in terms of the, the disinformation narratives and so on, there was a universal experience of um, shared suffering and, and shared exhaustion, you know, and shared concern, I think. Um, and so we actually found that there was, there, there, we're talking, you know, 0.2% difference between language groups um, that was identified. So it was incredibly consistent. Uh, that those, you know, that those top identified needs and those top identified um, impacts, uh, the experience of disinformation, the, the challenges around press freedom. So you had, you know, in the context of the US, you had a, you know, a, a kind of COVID denialist essentially, or at least a, you know, a, a, an operator who was suggesting um, potentially deadly responses <laughs> to COVID-19 treatments in the White House. And so you saw those challenges appearing in that context as well as in the context of other states where you might have traditionally expected to find such, um, you know, such challenges and narratives. So, um, you know, at the time we also um, suggested that what we were seeing in the data around um, journalists identifying both an increased sense of um, vocational commitment, you know, and um, also feeling more um, driven, you know, to to report effectively and to serve their communities in this context, they experienced a great, what, they, what they interpreted as a greater sense of trust in their work. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, Emily, if you want to pick up on this in terms of the global manifestation. Yeah, no, I think it's interesting that, that as I say, sort of the, the, the positive and um, uh, Natalia really sort of you know sketched out from the, the, the point of view of a practitioner, but that positive of people finding real meaning in their work came about through, uh, I think, I mean, off the hook traffic figures. So everybody, like in that first phase of the pandemic, both in the interviews uh, and to some extent in the data, you saw uh, the real sort of split between we think we're going to struggle financially, but like our, our traffic, the engagement, the way that our audiences are coming to us on a much more frequent basis. Uh, it, it, for meaningful stories, not for clickbait, but for yeah. meaningful stories, really sort of rise at the same time. We heard that over and over again, particularly in the US. Actually, the US is really interesting because it's not that different to, and, and things like sort of 20% of um, respondents said that they increase, uh, that journalists in, um, experienced a much greater level of harassment during uh, the pandemic. And again, this is not you know, America is one way, Europe is another way, Africa is another way, like all of this is, is, is now sort of um, shared. And I think that, 
you know, it, it, we know that it's a global industry and we know that we're all using the same tools and the same platforms and we all talk a lot more than we used to uh, and we share practices. But also this point that Natalia made is really powerful, which is the actual sort of adversarial landscape for journalists is the same everywhere and it obviously varies in wildly according to your press freedom laws, etc. But not that wildly when it comes to how uh, civil society is now being often manipulated by political actors and how the, the press's role in crises is weaponized yeah. to sort of in increase that hostility. Uh, Particularly the partisan news media, like we saw that in the Yeah, and we saw, well, again, we saw that with, so, so Fox News kind of registered as, um, well, sorry, I shouldn't say Fox News because it was not identified, but partisan <laughs> news outlets were also identified as a um, significant spreader. I think it was a sort of fourth or fifth on the, yeah, yeah. the threat model of, of as, 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 as spreaders of disinformation, which again, um, I think is interesting because it splits the field a little bit between, and one of our key recommendations, probably our top recommendation to funders, um, which came out of this, was that you have to prioritize uh, and I can hardly believe that I'm saying this, but, but we said you have to prioritise democracy reinforcing and uh, counter disinformation uh, Yeah, uh, and what does that mean exactly, if you can explain that a little bit? Well, so I think that we have learned that there are outlets, uh, news outlets, that are not intrinsically pro-democracy or not intrinsically aligned with um, fair access to voting, equality to information, um, that, that, then, that, that, that have very strong... Uh, political biases that put them in a camp that says they're not really acting on behalf of democracy. And again, that's, ha that's happening in America right now. We see it you know, sort of every day. Uh, and I think that also, you know, those, those, the focus on projects which identify the kind of environment that journalists operate within uh, is, is really important. By that we mean, again, sort of people who are mindful of uh, the challenges, um, sort of specific sort of, you know, community-based challenges, specific challenges to um, just being sort of, a, a, as it were, um, protected or, 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 or organisations that understand how to protect their uh, newsrooms, their reputations, and actually sort of, you know, their people in a really very sort of real sense. Uh, and when, as you say, Sharon, you know, what does that really mean? I think it means that you, it's not good enough just to say we've, we're producing a new model for news or we're producing a whizzy new thing. And I don't want to kind of beat up on the correspondent here, but I think it goes back to that thing about, you know, Natalia has been doing deep reporting on key areas for a long time and her staff have been doubling down on those areas. Uh, I'm not certain, I think the correspondent would have regrouped around that, but I think when you're offering to market is we have a new business model, we have a new technology platform, et cetera. It's not enough. You have to have that mission, I think, behind it as well. Definitely. And can I just very quickly jump in? I think, I mean, thank you, first of all. I appreciate that. But, um, you know, I think in some ways, I think with all this, like, disinformation conversations, um, you know, we get locked in and kind of frantic about like how do we, how do we fight disinformation? Yes. And I, I, I think we don't actually yeah. need to reinvent anything. Right. Um, I think what we need to do is just do some old-fashioned, good, old-fashioned reporting and journalism. And one of the hallmarks of quality journalism is journalism that proactively tells you a story instead of reacting to something. You know, I, I, I hate the whole term of battling in disinformation and combating disinformation. My job is not to combat anything. My job is to report on a crisis and disinformation is a crisis and it has the victims and uh, perpetrators, and it has human stories, and it affects us as societies, and we need to go and find them. Mm -hmm. Because if we just keep sort of reporting on what people say rather than what they do, you know, we, all we are doing is just amplifying the noise. Yeah. And that noise is such a big part of disinformation. And for me, one of the, one of the interesting outcomes from this period of reckoning that has happened um, with regard to the pandemic, but also in the context of the pandemic we had in um, many Western countries with the Black Lives Matter movement, for example. And there has been a reckoning around 
um, what quality journalism means in terms of not just interrogating the facts, not just presenting a variety of views, but drawing conclusions based on analysis. And, and you know, so critical independent journalism is part of the mix here. And I think there's been a lot of, um, you know, a lot of challenges in particular countries where the he said, she said model of reporting um, was considered to be appropriate. Um, well, it's not when he is saying <laughs> that, um, you know, that Ukraine is, is run by Nazis and it's not appropriate <laughs> when the president of your country is saying that you should drink something toxic, you know, to cure um, COVID-19. And I think that is a really important, um, you know, moment of reformation potentially, which is what we're talking about here in reference to the to the pandemic that's useful to unpack further. Do you yeah, so let, let me ask you that because one of your recommendations was maximize mm. trust. The newsroom should yes. maximize trust. So especially in the context of what you all are saying here about what is the job of journalism in a newsroom right now, what is, what is the job then to maximize trust? What does that recommendation actually mean <laughs> in practice? Well, we're talking about um, in terms of responding to the crisis recommendations for action from funders or other organizations that support journalism. Um, and here's, a, here's a, an interesting anecdote. And Abila and I, in a previous life, worked uh, for the Reuters Institute, and I'm still affiliated there. But we produced a report just before the pandemic, much like the correspondence business model, we produced a report that highlighted uh, the need for more physical connection, you know, deeper, more meaningful engagement with audiences, you know, <laughs> and then boom. <laughs> you know, people were even talking about, um, you know, performance journalism, so journalism as theatre and all these fascinating, you know, ideas, um, and the pandemic hits and it changes everything. Um, so when it comes to trust, um, I think what you've heard from, from Natalia so far is really important. So if you're investing in trust-centred journalism, you're investing in accurate um, reporting that is fiercely independent, that ensures it serves its communities. Um, and what, one of the other interesting uh, things about the, the, the journalists who we surveyed, um, you know, there was a real sense of shared suffering between journalists and audience, you know. Um, there was something quite unifying about uh, that experience. And in the you know, in the survey that we're currently running now, I think Nabila was pointing to some of the evidence around um, audience engagement. So now we have to think again, it's not necessarily reinventing audience engagement, but thinking again of what, what do we learn through this process about how to serve our communities, whether they're niche or they're global. Um, and, and, you know, the correspondent was, of course, trying to address some of the challenges that were emerging around transnational uh, experiences and unfortunately didn't survive to, to make that happen. But in reference to trust, it's it's, it goes back to some of the early understandings about how to improve relationships between newsrooms uh, or, or news publishers uh, and audiences, and that is to respect your audience, to extract um, additional diverse sources, um, and to demonstrate trust in expertise. And you know what we see with disinformation is an attack on expertise. And so, I think one of our one of our jobs as, as uh, journalists and news outlets is to is to ensure that, that we are recognizing and embracing and incorporating deep expertise into our reporting. You know, there's, there's a lot of criticism still of journalists and, uh, and journalism for being arrogant and dismissive and distant. And I don't think anybody here, <laughs> probably in this room, is, is of that ilk, but that's something to, um, to focus on. And the other, one of the other top findings, and I just want to come back to this, is because it really does stand out. Um, or well, two of them, but one of them is around the impact on press freedom, which we saw at the beginning of the, the pandemic, which is absolutely uh, continuing to manifest itself, which is restrictions on movement, restrictions on access to information, restrictions on physical access uh, to, to sources and stories, um, threats around surveillance, threats around um, online violence, as uh, Emily has alluded, and those are all still present. So in terms of responding um, to those crises, two of the, the key recommendations that, that we launched from that first part of the study were to support mental health responses in news organisations and to reinforce um, press freedom and journalism safety measures and to report actively on those challenges. You know, there's been, I think we've moved on from being concerned about reporting on threats to press freedom as though this was belly gazing. You know, it's now seen as a fundamental um, you know, pillar of um, democratic action to, to, to protect uh, press freedom. Just one thing I want to share before, sorry, before I forget, um, is that there are also real physical impacts. Um, and of course, mental health is manifests physically, but um, 
journalists got COVID. A lot of journalists got COVID and, very, and, and are still getting COVID. Um, and a significant number are suffering from long COVID. And one of the really poignant um, responses we've had from this second survey already uh, came from a journalist who said, um, on a personal level, it's hard for me to articulate the way the pandemic has had an impact. Long COVID has left me in a wheelchair and I don't know if I'll ever be able to do the intensive field reporting that I used to do pre-pandemic. So I think, you know, we need to prepare for those effects. I mean, the community globally, generally, is struggling with what long COVID is and how it manifests. But if you're a newsroom leader now, you know, there needs to be consideration around how to respond to those limitations. Um, and we certainly found in the first survey that one of the staggering <laughs> Uh, figures for me was that 30% of those 2,000 respondents said in uh, between March and May that year, 2020, that they had been sent into the field without a single piece of protecting uh, protective equipment, and that included hand sanitizer and face masks. So, you know, that talks to exposure up front. And are we, again, two years on, are we seeing, and Natalia, I'm curious about from your perspective, is it was just in a meeting where PPE all of a sudden was talking, was, was, was um, you know, bulletproof vests, was it wasn't masks suddenly. And do you think that um, COVID has taught us anything in terms of journalism safety, in terms of sending journalists out into the field with PPE? You know, it's very difficult for me to answer that question. I mean, um, because I come from one of the most safety conscious organizations um, in the world, which is the BBC. So I have carried that culture into the newsroom that I now co-run. And uh, so we are always very, you know, quite dogmatic about it. And it's one of the reasons why we don't have anyone on the ground in Ukraine right now, because we feel we cannot, we don't have the resources to provide the level of security that journalists in Ukraine currently need to be covering that war. Um, and in the same way, and there are you know, lots of stories that add context that can be done around it. And in the same way uh, with COVID, um, you know, we felt, I mean, I, I, I'm just, I might be the wrong person to be answering the question. Yes, I, I, I thought, you know, obviously you could only do the job and we were all, you know, we all owe huge debt of gratitude to people who were on those COVID front lines and, you know, in the hospitals and masked up. And of course, you know, they all had to be. And I think, you know, the point that Julie makes about sort of the, mm, suddenly us being in the same boat with our audiences is a very um, is a very powerful one because it affected um, absolutely everyone so we all became um, safety but we were we were, we were already very safety conscious <laughs> and obsessed to begin with <laughs> so. oh, did you want to say something Emily or no I'm oh, sorry no I should, well so, so so one thing I was going to say on the sort of the, the the safety on on the lines of the, the safety which <laughs> I'm sort of going to abstract into a slightly uh, broader point, which is, so when I talked about it being an accelerant uh, event, which has meant that you've had, I think, um, some tension within newsrooms, I think this idea of how news organisations actually support their employees, and, you know, I mentioned unionisation, it's not just unionisation, I think has become, it's, it's really been pushed to the fore by this. And online safety is uh, not as important as physical safety, you could argue, but in some other ways it's just as important. And I think what we're seeing now is this uh, sort of outburst really of, uh, you know, today, the New York Times has said, right, okay, so here are, here are our um, new social media guidelines. I know the, sort of the Guardian have um, issued some quite recently. Uh, we did a big report on this. Jake Nelson did a great report where he spoke to uh, 50 or 60 uh, journalists within newsrooms and, and this tension between feeling like you are a vulnerable individual that your newsroom does not know how to support so newsrooms just don't really know how to support people who are being harassed online for instance mm -hmm. and I think that this sort of idea of security and safety and support now has to be embedded mm -hmm. in newsroom okay. leadership or you're not going to get the best journalists to work for you. They're just going to leave and go somewhere else and set up on their own, I think. Can I, can I ask you that? That's, that's, that's absolutely right. And um, I think for us, the big learning curve was actually 
you know, mental health and mental health support uh, for the team. And, you know, we did it in all the ways we could. We had, you know, stay in the same channel on Slack and um, we tried to have, like, uh, lots of conversations and um, uh, about it. But I think, you know, um, it does feel like, because, because COVID was that unifying global experience, I think it did elevate the um, importance um, that, that kind of amplified that already existing emerging movement for kind of more mental health awareness in newsrooms. Um, and it just, you know, made it very relevant for everyone across the board, not just people who cover conflicts or wars, but actually absolutely everyone. And I think that is one of the actually positive outcomes of it. Yeah, yeah. it's both, when I mean, we saw, as Emily already said, um, you know, a really uh, significant um, number of people saying that online violence was much more significant and at, um, at ICFJ in partnership with UNESCO, we've, we've done a lot of research on uh, the impacts, but also the institutional failures at the, at the newsroom level as well as uh, the platforms. And while there are, um, you know, increased uh, levels of awareness, there are still really big gaps in terms of understanding how to effectively respond. Um, and as you say, you know, the leadership challenge uh, there is, is very significant. Uh, I know you said it was early data you had it, but, but when you say it's flipped and now mental health sort of yeah. is the top thing, what that says to me, just hearing that, is that more journalists are paying attention to it, but leadership still isn't quite getting yeah, the message. Yeah, potentially. Um, and, and the needs are more complex. Like, you know, when you have newsrooms that were, and, and journalists who, whether they're freelance or, or existing in newsrooms, already fatigued. Um, already burnt out as a result of, you know, perpetual, um, you know, renovation or reformation of, of their news organisations. And then you add to that the pandemic, which has seen, you know, massive amounts of overtime, people, you know, being stretched beyond limits, and now we've rolled right into another crisis. I think, I think that's partly what we're, what we're seeing too. That, but, but yes, it's um, leadership, you know, it really it has to come from the top. I mean, we've, we've learned that through both of these um, both of these studies, and I think, um, you know, if there's anything that could be said about, uh, even as this survey um, continues, about the way leader leadership in, in news organisations can respond, it's to put the emphasis on responding to those impacts. I mean, online violence continues to get worse in the context of disinformation in particular, and in the context of orchestrated disinformation campaigns. And so, you know, this, this has to be factored in. In a lot of our research, we found that, you know, news organisations were, were, were trying to respond with mental health support. They were trying to respond with digital security assistance, but they didn't necessarily understand the function of disinformation um, in, the, in the ways in which these attacks are uh, amplified, instigated, and, and exacerbated. And so that's, that's I think, a key, key, key learning that partly comes from the pandemic, and just before I forget, um, some of the, I mean, Emily referred to this earlier about, you know, distributed newsrooms and, and, and what can, we have asked questions, very thoughtful questions in this second survey about how people are feeling about working remotely. Do they want it to continue, you know? Is it having an impact on uh, editorial choices? And just this afternoon, when we, when we looked at this, you know, this data for the first time, um, we saw that um, the majority of people who've responded so far want to be able to continue to work from home um, but at the same time, they are concerned about what the implications of remote working are for enterprising journalism, for working collaboratively. And yet again, they talk about the fact that there's an upside to this, which means that they've had to be more creative and enterprising about the ways they've connected and communicated, which we'd started to see elements of, you know, in, in, the, in the first uh, phase of the research. And, and that was one of the recommendations that you have, which is more investment in collaborations. Is yes, that related exactly. to, to what you're talking about? Yes, I think it, I th absolutely. And I think that came out um, from the various panel discussions we held um, as part of this project in 2020 and early 2021. Um, and it's coming out in the, in the data now, yeah. And so what does that mean? Investment in collaborations, is that across newsrooms? Is that what, what we're... It's, it's both. I mean, so you, can, you can look. I'm about to share a link to the, um, to the, the last report we published, which was in, in March, which um, lays out the recommendations. But um, there are two which talk about the need for investment in collaboration within newsrooms, but between newsrooms as well, So, which is not a new concept, of course. International cross-border investigative reporting is, um, is increasingly important, particularly 
given the way we're seeing, uh, you know, the tilt towards fascism, frankly, um, you know, and the restrictions on, on reporting um, in many, many countries, this becomes more important. But so does um, collaboration potentially with, with experts, whether it's reporting on climate change, you know, to collaborate with um, academic institutions that have specialist practice. Um, we collaborate with the University of Sheffield, and we have a colleague here in the audience um, on big data analysis, you know, to try and um, deepen um, the insights that, that we get uh, in reference to online violence. And civil society organisations, you know, you've just seen the extraordinary work of the Pegasus Project, which was a partnership um, between, a, you know, a very important news, you know, collaborative news organisation, Forbidden Stories, and Amnesty International, you know, to, to really sort of strengthen those skills and try to fill the holes. And what about, um, Nabil, I'm curious, you talked before about sort of audience engagement and, um, is there collaboration, I mean, as we sort of emerge from the pandemic, is there collaboration with audience? Do you see that relationship changing, continuing to change? I've got to say something very important to ensure that I still have friends at the end of this panel <laughs> in terms of the colleagues that I used to work with, which is that the journalism that, that they were doing, which did not survive in that transnational media offering, continues. And they've taken their journalism to independent media platforms where they are actually deeply in contact with a lot of community which followed them. Uh, from the organization where we worked at. And so I think in that way, yes, I do see a deepening because I see that people are still interested in that journalism, but you've got to be more creative about the, the structure which provides you the freedom to be able to say what you do want to say and, and the journalism that you do want to report on. And I also wanted to say that um, in terms of collaboration, a lot of people in the 2020 survey said it was a solution that they thought was viable to be able to go forward and continue out of this sort of quagmire of, um, you know, the, the fact that they couldn't go out and report anymore. They thought that collaborating with each other across regions, uh, across countries was actually something that they'd like to do. Um, in this snapshot of the survey that we, that we looked at today, in this small, small sample set, uh, we had responses from Venezuela, the Pacific, India, and Hong Kong, you know, cited, uh, where people say it's hard to do their work uh, with regards to press freedom threats, especially in the pandemic. So I think definitely there's evidence there that people would like that, journalists would like that as a solution in terms of collaboration. I'm sorry, you oh, oh, sorry. Um, Emily, I wanted to ask you, you talked before earlier about, as we, I think, close to wrapping up, we're not allowed to do questions, right? Just no questions. No, apparently we're not allowed to do questions because of yeah, concerns been, about social distancing. We've literally been given a yeah, thing okay, saying, okay. please, no, no audience questions. questions. I don't, but, I don't well, really hold with that. I think you should ask. I know, I know. That's why I haven't stopped for questions because I remember the directive. I think you can yell out questions if you have any. We'll be yeah. fine okay, with that. Can we do that? Honestly. Yeah. I want, I, I mean, you're masked and, and there's not too many of us, so I'm... I think we can oh, we, everyone, okay. I, yeah. <laughs> actually, I think we should hear from you because you're our South African colleague who actually, in the pandemic, running a digital platform, launched a print paper and found innovative ways. <laughs> he said, we're mad, we're crazy, to, to quote him. It's <laughs> We call him the king of retrovation, Bronco, <laughs> Bronco in the front, yeah. in a very effective way. So does anybody have a question that they would like to ask, masked or, or otherwise? Uh, Bronco, go ahead. Um, okay, this looks like there's many tunnels in Kosovo. Is there any tunnel with some light at the end? <laughs> <laughs> there's lots of tunnels right now. We started out with some light. We had some good light. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of the coverage of the but pandemic or responses well, to... It was something optimistic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Can I, can I answer first, and then I'm sure I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> Natalia, why, are you crying or laughing? Okay. <laughs> I am, you know, I find a lot of solace in the fact that, you know, there is, feels like there's some meaning in the work um, that we're doing, but um, I, again, like, this is not how we wanted to prove 
the model. Um, and it's not, it really isn't. <laughs> I'd give quota up if the, the war could stop in Ukraine tomorrow. Uh, um, and I think, uh, so, so no, I'm struggling to find reasons to be optimistic. And I think it is really important to, but uh, look, we're not gonna give up, right? Mm. We can't give up. Yeah. Like there is, no, uh, there is no giving up. So um, that's not an option. So since it's not an option, we just need to buckle down and uh, team up. And you know, we would not be able to do it without our partners around the world, you know, from Nicaragua to the Philippines. And um, you know, we, should, we should band together because mm. You know, the, the press freedom, I mean, you touched on it. I, it's such a, the press freedom has real enemies mm. that, who have real power it's a very important and story. a yeah. lot of yeah. money, yeah. and they are at war with journalists. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's war, so we yeah. need to... <laughs> um, Let me get my crystal. Yeah. It's always the last thing. I do, I do. I have, I have, I have something optimistic to say. Well, um, you know, my recommendation is to talk to any Ukrainian because they yeah. seem to be the most optimistic yeah. people. <laughs> and like, they are incredible. Exactly. They are literally, I, I call my friends in Kiev to get some, you know. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> please, please help me remain sanguine like they, about this. You know, journalism. because they have a, they have a, I, I think, Partially, I mean, obviously they're all amazing, but also they have a real sense of purpose. Yeah. But there is no reason why the rest of us shouldn't have a real sense mm. of purpose because, you know, this is this is not just an attack on right. on a country. It's an attack mm. on the values mm. that enable our industry and our Indeed. profession. Mm. And if we don't defend it yeah. uh, with the tools that we have, then oh. we're Good. And let me give you, just let me give you a positive example, sorry, I just want to, I want to share this. You, I, I know it's a, an example that has been rolled out for several years now, but you have a look at Rappler in the Philippines, um, where, you know, the Nobel Prize uh, winning uh, CEO and former editor-in-chief Maria Ressa is at the helm. Before the pandemic, um, and, and even as they were coming under the most prolific uh, attacks across all channels, um, physical as well as digital, they were reinventing their business model in a very effective way. They have broken even. Right. They are starting to increase their profits in the context of these existential crises and myriad external threats to the very practice of journalism. And what is key and core is just what Natalia has said in reference to the Ukrainian journalists too. It's that sense of mission and vocation that's driven them, but it's in combination with a lot of learning based on uh, experience in the industry and a journalism startup led by journalists, you know, not led by technologists, led by journalists, um, and trying to respond to all of these threats in creative ways that serve their audience, regardless of the attacks that they experience, they are surviving. I mean, what will be the big test, of course, is the outcome of the next election in the Philippines. You know, has all of this um, actually led to a, a plan for survival um, now that the business model is secure, can they actually survive all of the press freedom threats? And sorry, Emily. Emily. No, I was just going to say, I think that, you know, as you know, Branko, but almost anybody, that, that actually this is a really critical year for um, not just journalism, but actually for democracy. Mm -hmm. And, what, you know, we have half a dozen, you know, so my friend Patricia here knows that also from Brazil, mm -hmm. that there are a number of elections and we will see in the course of this year whether the world is going sort of further towards darkness yes. um, and I think that Ukraine uh, has demonstrated to people who are not paying attention that actually this discussion of disinformation networks of there being an anti-democratic extremist movement which is everywhere which exists in the United States now is not just a fantasy or a conspiracy theory, but it's real and it's having, and actually there is a conclusion um, which is uh, ugly and takes us back 80 years in, in Europe and the people with the money and the power in Europe and America, if they want to address this, they have to address it not just in their own backyards, they have to help address it everywhere because it's not binary and it's not one country or two countries or whatever. It, it, it is 
you know, the, the small world is, is, in, is in peril when it comes to democracy. And I think that journalists, we have to keep telling that story that, you know, this is not an accident. These, I, these are not isolated incidents, you know, whether it's the war in France, Bolsonaro, you know, whether it's um, kind of the, the movement in America where you have Peter Thiel putting $30 million into reshaping that, that it's all the same. And I think journalists really do, you know, my students get a mission from this. I think every journalist gets a mission from this, but we have to keep telling that story. So that, that's, that's a light. It may be a train coming in the opposite direction. And, 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 and we also have to keep making it relevant to audiences yes. who are yes. far away. We have to be, yeah. get better at connecting the dots. You know, yeah. I mean, the, the news is easy. The context is you have to work harder. Uh, right to create that context for local audiences that you don't necessarily so that, and that's our job like we need to figure out a way of how to explain to audiences in Texas why Mar Maria Ressa's story yeah. is important right. for them too yeah. so in that sense I think noble for I mean I've disagreed with many normal Peace Prize Committee decisions, <laughs> but in that case, it was an, an amazing boost to freedom of expression and, and journalism because it was just a recognition that, you know, the, the fight is real. Was that optimistic for you? Yeah. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's a good way to end. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, panelists. Thank you, everybody, for joining us.